For those of you not aware of Citizens Online, uh, we're an independent digital inclusion charity. We were established in the year 2000. And since that time, we've only ever focused on digital inclusion. Um, we have worked all around the UK in over 60 communities. And the work that we do helps individuals. So we run digital champion programs to help people with essential digital skills. And we also work with organizations as well. We see digital inclusion as part and parcel of digital transformation. And the message and the support we give to organizations really says to them, you know, you might want to move your services online. However, there's a big percentage of people who can't use online services competently or don't have devices. So we make sure that they're aware of that, make sure that there's um, channels for assisted digital, but also get them to think about inclusion right from the beginning of the project. So anything that they're designing, they're designing to make it simple, accessible for all and easy to use as well. And we get organizations to think about embedding digital inclusion throughout their organizations as well. Because as we've been around for um, 20 years, this sadly is not a problem that's uh, going away because obviously technology demands more from us um, as it moves on so quickly. So it's really about um, giving people that lifelong learning and the confidence to adapt with that and keep their skills up to date as well. So that's in a nutshell, um, what we do. So our mission is, as I've mentioned, to help organizations ensure that people aren't left behind in the switch to digital and to uh, help people with essential digital skills. My name's Helen. I'm the Managing Director at Citizens Online and also on the session with me today I have my colleague Brian. Do you want to say, introduce yourself, Brian? Everyone. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for joining us. And Brian manages our um, project in Brighton and Hove called Digital Brighton and Hove. That is a digital champions project. It's been running for five years now. We have over 400 digital champions involved. And we also work with over 300 organizations in the area as well. And we'll talk more about how we've developed that over the years um, and give you some tips and tricks throughout the session. So we'll, we'll run through first, uh, what is a digital champion? Understand a bit more about the role. We'll then give you some tips on how the digital champions can be supported. Give you some things to think about and consider and a bit of a checklist for the project when you're setting it up. And then plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Do keep putting your questions into the chat box. Thank you. Brian, over to you. Thank you. So the core cool thing is digital champion, digital champion, digital champion. And what's that about? So essentially it's the whole thing about digital, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's about being a human. And being a champion is someone who advocates best practice. Um, the key things are that we need people um, to offer support to learners that are getting started and coach people. And the key thing about coaching is that you don't go in with a pre-conceived uh, agenda. You have to meet people at their point of ability and coach them and work with them. And that means doing things like speaking languages that they understand. Um, there are examples of um, trying to tell people to, where to find the settings. And the lady says, oh, well, I can't see settings, but I can see something that looks like a pie. And go, yes. Pi is what it is, Pi is what you use. Um, we encourage people to learn more and to sign, and, and when we don't know, or when it's outside our remit, we, we all digital champions are taught to signpost for further help. So that could be back to a referral organization or to an external organization that we may partner with um, that can support someone further. Um, the digital champions, they assess the learner skill and, um, and they tailor their assistance to their needs. So, as I said, it's really about finding out what's the key hook 
someone, um, what's, what's the bit that they need help with. Um, and you may have, for example, you might be working with a key demographic um, and you have a focus on particular outcomes, but regardless of that, you still need to find a hook for the individual. And then of course, to demonstrate um, and be uh, a model person. So what makes a good digital champion? The ability to communicate, uh, pass on knowledge to, ne to, to learners. Um, that's going to be a, a really strong uh, strength, strong strength that you need. Uh, being patient, friendly, and I'd add another P in there, which is passionate about helping people. Um, organized, punctual, and courteous. Um, the, the, it's very difficult now to be late as a digital champion because uh, a lot of the support is remote um, and so needs to be ready to deliver anyway. So very um, uh, rare opportunity that you can be late for your own meeting. Uh, and be creative and open to new ideas and approaches. And I think that's the key thing. Um, the whole thing about being a digital champion is learning by doing. Um, as, as I said, there's no preconceived method of doing it. It's just the key thing is the ability to connect with people and to find um, how best to support them. So a couple of things, we've talked about what a digital champion should be, um, but a couple of things that they definitely don't have to be. You don't have to be a technology whiz to be a digital champion. Uh, you don't have to be an expert. Um, and you're certainly not an extension of the IT help desk as well. You're not really there to fix people's printers. Um, and something that we're often asked uh, when we're working with organisations to help them do this kind of work is um, people will say, oh, we've, I've talked to the local college and the local college have got loads of young people that are going to volunteer and be digital champions. And I think that's all well and good. But I really want to stress to you all that the types of people that you'll be helping with digital skills often have additional needs as well sometimes. Um, we've been seeing a lot of instances at the moment. It's, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's a very worrying and difficult time for people and they're struggling for all kinds of reasons. And I think if you've got younger people um, providing that support, they just need to have a bit of maturity about them, a bit of sensitivity as well. You know, we've helped with um, learners recently. We've had cases of um, people not having any food and being very distressed about that. And it's just about having that awareness. And, and I think that's something that young people have um, the digital skills, but it's about that sensitivity as well about the people that you'll be dealing with and helping. As Brian said, it's absolutely a person-centered approach. So you might um, be wanting to set up a digital champion project with health outcomes as a focus and, and that's all well and good but to get people started you've got to get them interested in something and for somebody it might be football for somebody it might be local history or um you know did you know you can get knitting patterns online if you're into knitting or recipes whatever it is that's how you'll start them and that's why it's quite an individual approach as well to this uh work um to make it successful and patience is key. And as Brian said, yeah, people who are passionate about helping others is really key as well. Nobody knows everything about technology. That's what we tell the champions as well. It's quite nice to show your vulnerability to a learner sometimes. Um, you know, they might ask you a question about some device that you're not an expert on and you can say, do you know what? I'm not sure. Let's work together and how find an answer to that. And then it's demonstrating to people, you know, how to search it, how to look at that information and make sure it's reliable and how to find a solution to that problem as well. When we talk about digital champions, we talk about a number of different types of digital champion. I think most of us have done a bit of this work in some form or another. Somebody we know gets a new phone or a tablet and they ask us how to take a photograph or uh, how to make the text bigger or something. And just demonstrating that to somebody is, is being a digital champion. Um, we refer to professional digital champions as well. And these are people who it's their paid job. That's what they get up and do every day or part time. Um, they're, they're paid to do this, this kind of work. And in the Brighton project, we have a paid um, professional digital champion. 
The, the other kind that we refer to are embedded digital champions. Now, these are so key. Um, an embedded digital champion is somebody already working within an organization, doing some other role. They might be a social subscriber, they might be a customer contact center, they might be an environmental health officer, they might be a leisure center assistant, or anybody who's dealing with the public um, in some way, shape, or form, you know, working in a community center, job center, library, whatever it is. And then as part of their role, they are confident and trained to say to people, did you know you can do that online? Have you got a device? Have you got five minutes? I'll show you. Um, having embedded digital champions is the best way to make this work sustainable. You know, we talked about embedding it into people's um, roles and people's organisations. Digital skills are just part of day to day life now. There's just no getting away from it. Um, so it's everybody's responsibility and embedding your digital champions, as I said, will make it sustainable in the longer term. And we also have volunteer digital champions who are amazing. And what we've seen, especially with the reaction to the pandemic from the public, has been so many people willing to help with this work. And it's absolutely fantastic. We have a lot of volunteers working for us at Citizens Online. So they are fantastic. However, they do need um, some resource to manage them as well. So um, just bear that in mind when you're setting up if you're going to be working with um, volunteers. We mentioned the essential, helping people with essential digital skills. There's a reason for that. There is a recognized framework called the Essential Digital Skills Framework. I'm not gonna go through it here in detail. I just wanna make you aware that it exists. And these are the skills deemed as the essential skills for life. This is what people need to do. And it's to give your digital champions an idea of the types of things they'll be helping people with. So it's, you know, setting up an email address, being able to communicate online, being able to safely find information online, things like that. I will send you the link because we'll send the slides around, but just be aware that it exists and it's a good starting point when you give examples to your digital champions of the type of work they'll be helping with. Brian, over to you. Thank you. So supporting your digital champions. Um, the key thing about this work before even embarking on it is to understand your organization's digital maturity. What, and that means, what are they, what's their concept of what it means to be digitally included? Um, and that may take many shapes or forms. It can undertake a survey as to, you know, do people understand different forms of social media, different channels of digital communication, um, you know, how many times, if ever, people access NHS services or shop online. And the reason that's important because it needs to be, the, the clear way to make this work is that it has to have a top-down approach. Management all the way through needs to understand the benefits of not only what this is for the organization, but um, for the end users. So that means you need to have a clearly defined role uh, and that obviously the role work that you do and etc. Um, you need to understand the, the barriers. Um, so currently we're in an international pandemic. So what are going to be the core barriers to entry in initiating the program? I mean, you've got the program started, then what are the barriers that you're going to cover? I can run through a whole list of those, but they really quite extensive. I, th I think on the barriers as well, it's about making sure that your champions understand the reasons why people might not be likely to be able to get online as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, age is, is often um, a barrier. Motivation is a factor, factor. Mm -hmm. fear is a factor, um, and connectivity can be a factor as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of barriers, not only for um, people to get online but as Brian said actually there can be barriers in the current climate to actually doing this work as well. Sorry Brian, over to you. Okay, I'm um, sorry for those who, who can't hear me, it's that time of day where the signal goes a bit skew with. Uh, so I'll talk a little slower so you can pick up anything. Um, so again the next thing is, is training, you need to think about how will you de deliver training. 
uh, not only for your digital champions, but for the people you support. Um, safeguarding is, is, is essential. Safeguarding your volunteers, your embedded champions, um, and um, safeguarding your, the end users. Um, that now includes being aware of GDPR, being aware of things that they may be ex exposed to online. Um, so you need to look at whatever your processes are to um, look at your local support network. Uh, the key, the key thing about the work that we do is that we work in a network. So we are continually learning and sharing best practice amongst um, the digital Brighton and Hove network. So be mindful that not all the answers have to come from you just because you're the lead in your vicinity. Um, and for embedded champions, um, ensure that there's support uh, within their workload, because as we say, this, this is something which is potentially an addendum to what they do. Um, and the last thing you want is for someone to feel, um, um, what's the word, saddled with something that they're the only people that seems to be interested in. Um, so there's a whole load of different subsets, um, but ensuring that, that your volunteers have clearly defined and understood volunteer roles. Uh, and, and that's going to be within a volunteering framework. Um, and another thing is being committed to tracking and reporting the progress of participants. It's always a difficult thing, but it needs to be thought of from the outset. But it's not only just about delivering the support, it's about how do you collect the data? Because the last thing you want is to get an application for equipment to support people. And then when it's time to report, they say, who do you work with? And you're gonna go back and go, oh, now we need to do some kind of... Think about how you do that from the beginning and be mindful of whether or not it's intrusive or not. A core tool that we have is provided by Digital Unite. So they're the forerunners in digital championing in the UK. And they have uh, the Digital Champions Network, which we abbreviate to the DTN. It's a phenomenal resource. It has a number of free uh, training resources online. Um, there's a brilliant community forum, which is... Um, it really responsive and uh, monitored by people who participate in championing all across the country. Um, you can find specific session plans and worksheets um, that can help you. So if you're thinking, okay, I've done the training online or I've got a clue, now how do I set up a session? How do I support someone? Well, you can find all of these information on the DTN. Now, we recommend the Digital Champions Network because we've worked with them for a number of years and we've contributed to um, some of the information on, on their site. Uh, but there's plenty others out there, not least of all um, Good Things Foundations uh, sites um, and, and some others. Even Microsoft has got a number of free accredited courses that you can um, get online. But the core thing is, is that with this, you have... Um, once you're online, you can have CPD accredited courses and Mozilla accreditation. That's all free. Um, the Digital Champions Essentials course and another one called Using Your Role to Help uh, Customers Get Online uh, is a fantastic course and they are all CPD accredited. Um, and, um, can I just, sorry, yeah, Brian, can I just clarify? There is actually, uh, um, it's not free for the digital champions network but it's a small cost but it's what we use to train there, there were some free offers during um the pandemic i'm just not sure whether that's still running or not anymore which is why i just didn't want to give anybody any false information there but it, it's not an expensive system mm. and this is how what we use to train our volunteers but as brian said there are some other training um resources out there but you just need to think about what's the option for you i also know that in dorset actually they built their own training for their volunteers. So 
um, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of different options and you just need to make sure that they are got that training and support. Sorry, Brian. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, with that, as Helen said, you know, there's a small price to access, but that's it. It's just a nominal fee for the upkeep. But then everything in, you know, if you want to do training or, or do the training again or do a refresher, there's no charge for that. You don't have to pay again. You don't have to pay for the accreditation. It's all um, accessible and free once you're in line. So some things to consider uh, are some core bits uh, when you're uh, laying out your plan to set up a digital champion program. Um, so you want to think about recruitment. Um, that could be how many virtual now in the pandemic. So um, if you are a locations-based organization, you need to think about how you're going to recruit people and how you're going to get them to work remotely. And then what's their availability? So the way that we're working it in Digital Brighting and Hope, when we recruit them, we know what kind of um, support they want to do. Uh, we want to, we know what's their general availability and we know what type of, um, uh, when I say what type of support, there's two ways. So do they want to support someone that has, that they can just stick with one person and support them or they just want to be, okay, give me the next client, give me the next client. And the other way is how do they want to support is um, what sort of things are they happy to focus on? Do they just want to be a, a general digital champion or do they want to focus on um, digital communications or social media or email? Or do you have an all-rounder? So it's always good to do a skills audit whilst recruiting your digital champions. But then you can always get them trained up. Equipment. Uh, we're talking about remote. Do, do, do they have the right equipment? Do you have the right equipment? I've spoken to some organisations um, that only have one camera between you know seven computers and they have to book it in order to use it so make sure that you have um the right equipment to enable your um or uh your clients uh, we've now entered into doing phone support uh, so that's something that you could offer there are a number of software tools online that can help um you your organization run like a call center uh, yeah, because it's just that we what you need know, to think about when he's offering phone support is um, you don't want any learners to have anybody's personal phone numbers. So that's yeah. just a bit to consider there. Yeah. Have a main line and anyone can call it. And if you're not available, you know, they can leave a message and your team can pick it up and pass it on to someone, etc. Um, virtual support. You know, think about once you get started, are you able to uh, provide webinars? It's something that we do, continually offering updates in training or uh, talking about new developments. Uh, we had one before Christmas talking about scams and, um, and we invite people in to talk about their professionalism in that field. Um, we network the digital champions together as well because because yeah. everyone's doing this work remotely at the moment it's quite easy to feel a bit isolated so it's nice to get on a zoom session and you know talk about what's working well share best practice and and actually just say hello to people as well so we're doing a lot of that at the moment with our champs yeah uh, and the penultimate thing is the website info it, is it clear what your offer is um you know it might sound obvious but people may not know that you're offering digital champion support or recruiting for digital champions. Um, so you may have a, a great um, user base, but they're not aware of how to get involved um, and how it pertains to them. So particularly, say for example, you're a rambling organization who does walks, um, you may think, okay, well, why would I need to be online? Um, or why would I need to support someone online? So make sure that's clear. Um, and something that we've been really successful at delivering are tablet loan schemes. Um, so that's a, a scheme whereby we uh, obtain funding to get um, a moderately uh, good quality um, tablet. Uh, we configure it, ensure that it has all of the necessary um, uh, applications on it, and then we get it out to our vulnerable client base. 
And actually, we yeah. ran a webinar on running yeah. a tablet loan scheme as well. So we'll send you the link to that as well, because we've recorded it if um, anybody needs further info on that. And as Brian said, we, we run three tablet loan schemes around the UK at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. So just a wrap up checklist before we get to the Q&A. Um, first of all, the most important thing to run in a digital champion scheme or any digital inclusion work is who's going to own it. Somebody needs to run it and be responsible for it and push the work. It, you know, even if with the best volunteers in the world, they these things don't run on wheels. They they don't run by themselves. You know, people, somebody needs to own it. So you need some resource behind it. And it goes without saying that the more resource you have, the better and bigger it will be. Um, but even if you can get somebody part time or one day a week or you share it but somebody needs to be responsible and own it and that's the way to really make it fly and um, thinking about your recruitment and your comms so that's one to get your digital champions on board and two your messaging out to your learners and organizations who want to signpost to your digital champions as well so get your comms plan together think about your training so how are you going to train your digital champions um, we mentioned the Digital Champions Network, there are others out there, that, but you, you need to have something in place um, to, to give people the, those specialist tips. Uh, safeguarding, you must have a process in place. As I've said, we've had some very distressed people calling us um, recently, so you need to have a process in place for how you can make sure that those people can get help and also to protect your digital champions as well. At the moment, a lot of people are doing this work just over the phone, one to one. It's, so it's a bit different to when it was done, you know, in a public place. Um, and you want your champions to make sure that they feel supported um, should anything make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, Brian mentioned monitoring and evaluation. This is really key to finding more funding to keep projects sustainable. Um, what's difficult about this work is that funders will always want numbers. <laughs> And for us at Citizens Online, we argue that it isn't just about, uh, you know, getting somebody to use a computer and then thank you by getting on to the next person. It's actually about d developing someone's confidence and giving them a real quality service. And that isn't actually quick work most of the time. So do think about that with funders as well and, and don't try to overpromise because yeah, like say, giving, giving somebody half an hour or one session, you know, it probably isn't enough to keep them encouraged and motivated to really grow and do more online. Um, but do have some sort of system in, in place as, as well of, of how you're going to do that. Uh, working partnership, it's what we do at Citizens Online. Um, everybody is doing a little bit of this work. You'll find so many organisations that are concerned with this work actually work together on it. Um, and do do that because again you know where to the very minimum know where to signpost people um, if they do need some sort of, of specialist help. But you know, getting a partnership together in an area again, if you're trying to find funding, that's what funders like. They like organisations working together on these problems, and that all feeds into how you make a project sustainable as well. And that is by working in partnership on it. So I um I will send these um slides round. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen at the moment um, so we can move on to the Q&A and we'll take people off the mic um, to have a chat and ask the questions. So bear with me a second. Um, I'll go through some in the group, in the chat, sorry, whilst you set up. Perfect. Um, so yes, a, a great discussion around cost being a limiting factor, which is um, evidenced by homeschooling. So that's a, a, a core factor. Um, uh, so Fred asks if there was a particular accredited course that digital champions can attend. Um, and Phil Brannigan shared his um, CPD badge, um, which you can cool. do via the Badger system. Uh, the DCN 
also does the badge system, the Mozilla badges uh, for the courses that you do. Um, but the CPD course at Digital Champion Essentials is accredited um, by CPD. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lucia, um, you asked about uh, the barrier. Do you want to expand on your question? Because you said you'll ask it later. Yes, um, thank you. Um, the first barrier we find, uh, we work in an organization that uh, supports uh, vulnerable and isolated people in the Ho Peninsula in Medway, Kent. And um, the barrier we found is that when surveying uh, the partners, which are the clients, to see if they will be likely to enroll in, in some sort of training with our volunteers um, as part of our befriending, actually. Um, they didn't seem to be very interested. Now, um, we know the need is there because things are digitalized mm. as we speak. So um, how would you um, prepare the digital champion to actually create um, an environment where they feel like they actually want to be there? It's a really good point. So last, the biggest um, survey on internet use in the UK is carried out every year by Lloyds. And last year, they asked people who were offline, what would motivate you to get online? And 48% of those people said absolutely nothing. Motivation is a huge factor for people. Now, you mentioned enrolling on training. I don't know what that entails, but what I will say is that you will see a lot of, you know, six weeks get started with IT down at the library or the adult learning college and, and whatever it is. Those courses are great and there is a place for them. But when you're starting people on their digital journey, you've got to give them a reason for them to understand why it's relevant for them. So it fits into what we were saying about finding that hook and finding motivation for people. And that starts by finding out what people are interested in. Now, a lot of organisations, as I said, so you know, a housing association is always going to be interested on their tenants, in their tenants, you know, reporting their repairs online and things like that. It's all valid. It's, it's, it's all really relevant, but that's not going to be the thing that gets somebody started on their journey. So it's all about finding out what people are interested in and then trying to make it relevant for them and giving them a reason of why the internet is for them. Peer-to-peer -peer works very well as well. So like I say, it's all right, um, you know, me telling Mrs. Jones why why the internet is wonderful and she can order a shopping online. But actually Mrs. Jones's friend telling her, oh, well, I did this online. That's a real motivating factor as well, the peer-to-peer -peer, um, hook. So I would recommend trying those two approaches. And, and like I say, I don't know what the end rolling is, but sometimes we find with getting people started with digital things, it's quite an informal start to it as well. So it's not really a commitment from them. It can just be, you know, sort of little nudges and sort of sowing seeds to get people started as well. Thank you. Yeah, our idea, sorry, just um, our idea was actually to, to implement it as part of our befriending. So we have volunteers befriending our clients and those who are IT savvy enough to actually um, show them how to use certain things on our device. But more or, like if a friend was showing you how to use it, then actually training, proper training. Sounds great. Um, Any more? Sorry, go on, Brian. Yeah, there's quite a few questions. Um, they're all popping up. Um, someone asked if we uh, reconnect befriending, asked, do we offer a dongle to try out before they commit to signing up to broadband provision? And do you want to talk about how we provide our tablets, Helen? Um, our tablets come with a SIM card and that's how we provide it. We've also done some other projects in Brighton, so Brian, you might want to talk about this, but um, where we put MiFi devices into some sheltered accommodation for homeless people during the pandemic as well. Um, so in, ter but in terms of yourself, you know, giving somebody a dongle to try out before they commit to sign up to broadband, absolutely. Because as I said, they've got to really find a reason for why they would want the internet in the first place. Um, but we just give them SIM cards with our tablets. Um, so yeah. Um, another problem is that um, creative sustainability said they found the biggest problem engaging with participants online via Zoom is unstable Wi-Fi, um, <laughs> hence my choppy voice earlier. So 
Um, I can support people to make improvements with that when that person has limited resources or understanding around that area. It's really, really difficult. Um, I do know an organisation, I will post the link, and they've done, um, they've written a load of resources to explain to people how to improve your Wi-Fi connection within your own home. Um, so they're a really good starting point and they're just a little social enterprise and the name escapes me at the moment, but I will, I will post that round to everybody after the session. Um, and yeah, in terms of the cost barrier, there's no easy way around that, sadly. Um, there are a number of broadband providers who do low cost options. So hyper optic one, but there, I must admit their footprint isn't huge, but hyper optic um, do a deal for 10 pounds a month and it's, it's a really, really good connection speed. Um, but connection is still a problem around the UK and there's, there's no magic wand for that, unfortunately. We do a lot of work in um, North Yorkshire. We've worked right up in the Highlands and Islands and, you know, connectivity is still a huge issue there. But even in central London, you'll find places where the connection just isn't that good. You know, you can be um, even in the middle of London. So, yeah, it, it's ongoing, really, um, and difficult, I would say. Um... Yeah, so it's somebody who would like to ask a question. Um, Sky Crook Volunteer Centre in Bexley. Hi, thank you. It's just because something you'd said and I just wanted to kind of catch it. Um, I'm pondering on um, whether it's possible to... I, I've, I've relaunched a project in lockdown because my project closed because it wasn't possible to do it remotely. Um, and we've created a whole new project, which is about digital inclusion. And so a lot of my work has been connected. So I'm working with people that have never done a Zoom meeting kind of in six months of lockdown. Um, it's very new for not always data, not always cost, sometimes confidence and motivation. So I've done a lot of work and seen breakthrough in people joining a Zoom group and going on to do other things off the back of that. And I'm kind of pondering whether it's possible to take that client group and one of the options be that they them some themselves become digital champions. So even though they're quite new to it, do you think there's a scope that maybe we're not going to be offering really complex support with tech, but, but of just of being that kind of moral support that other Absolutely. people have seen that work, even though they maybe don't have the massive technical skills? Yeah, no, as long as they've got the confidence to do it, then I think that's a great example. Um, and, and we would certainly recommend that. Um, and, and as we say, you know, nobody knows everything about technology at all, but it is about having the confidence to find out the answer and to work your way around that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a wonderful idea and, and sounds like you're doing amazing work there in, um, in Bexley. And um, we're about to, to start doing a bit of work in Bexley, actually. So I will come I have a feeling I may have been well. connected up with that because I am part of <laughs> with Bexley Council and Dorothy. So I think I might, I might be involved in that in some way. But that sounds Bexley great. Council yeah, we should. My project, so um, yeah, so yeah I'll be in touch. Definitely have a chat about that. that. Sounds lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else would like, have got a question? If you can also raise, raise your hand digitally. There's Shauna with your hand up. Would you like to? Uh... Um, well, I, my, I've worked previously for Hanover and then I've returned and now it's Anchor Hanover and it's a new organisation. We've got 1,700 locations nationally. We're an over 55 um, retirement scheme. Um, and we used to offer face-to-face -face sessions to do this and now we're trying to do it remotely. And we have a, tab a suite of tablets that some have SIM cards in, some need to have Wi-Fi connection and we are distributing them. And I've been trying to design a framework that gives the volunteers confidence alongside also being able to deliver alongside their day job. So I have been very prescriptive and not having a hook. I've, I'm quite familiar with, um, did, we are signed up with Digital Champions Network and I've, sit, I've met Brian before at conferences and things like that. So I'm very familiar with the hook and I 100% get that. But where we're at at this moment in time, I feel that we need to be quite prescriptive because while I wasn't here, people were just sending out tablets and going, ring me if you want a bit of help. People don't know what they want help with if they don't know what's available. So I've put a six week programme together 
And I am coming across a few barriers because I've tried to target people that have no experience and we don't have the resource to set up the devices. Ideally, we know that's what you need. We need somebody in the Bradford office. I'm 300 miles away from the tablet to set these up and distribute them, but we, we don't have that. So I'm trying to frantically do the most atrocious training videos using a Zoom call to myself, holding the tablet saying, this is how you turn it on. This is how you get a Google account. This is how you get Zoom. But it's trying to, if there's anybody out there that's doing something similar with people that have gotten no skill at this moment in time, but we're trying to get them onto Zoom because at least we can share our screen. But we're mm. finding I've spending hours and hours with people to the point where we're still not on a Zoom call doing it over the phone. Um, Feel your pain. <laughs> And I say to the champions and the residents, you know, the two words, it's funny that you, we pick P's. I'm like persistence and patience. That's literally the main things right now, you know. Um, but I just think I would take up too much time on this call with the amount of questions that I have. Um, so I'm wondering we, if there's anything that I could be signposted to or follow up with. We'll we'll put we'll share some resources and, and we did like I said we did do a webinar on the tablet loan schemes and I think that'll have some really good yeah, pointers in for you. The thing that we do with ours is we write instructions with the tablets. Yeah. That are like easy, you know, layman's mm. terms. Literally, like this is the screen, this button here. When we say home is the you know home button, and and this is the way you switch it on. You know, nothing like the manufacturer's instruction. <laughs> no, well, I've tried um, to use Digital Unite um, and I used Android device because we've got a suite of Samsung Tab A because then at least that's the one uniform thing that we do have. So the champions can get confident in terms of knowing the device. Mm. Um, I put the six week lesson plan together, a six week guidance document together and the videos will hopefully show different learner styles, so visual, audio, learner like via zoom but it's that even just for a six-week course it's 33 different items to do on three different platforms that's over it's, 100 it's a lot material and actually what we say about setting up tablet loan schemes and you you said it is setting up that tablet takes about yeah. an hour so yeah. even 30 tablets there's a there's a lot of resource we actually um work with a um refurbishing device provider right. and they help us to set up so we pay okay. people to do that so uh, that's that saves yeah. a bit of time but it is just something that you need to build in and uh yeah it sounds at the minute it, i'm trying to do this training video that i will send to an on-site location manager that again will have very level very level of skill set to say ring me up watch this video and i'll try and help you set it up when it's there because the people in the bradford office are unable to to do it it's, it's it's resource really we know what needs to be mm. done but there is it's not there yeah i think i think that's it and and people are um commenting in the chat shauna as well saying um about the resources on on uh youtube and um you know it's talking about similar experiences um and building the tablets and things and and you're right it's time and as we mm. said from the beginning it, this is the important thing to this work it, it's it's not quick and it's not easy so it is having that resource um i think just a quick thing that that helps is uniformity if you, you you're using the same tablet it will help it won't save you the time but it will help and then you can do things like get have instructions printed out and sent off that's and what then, i'm hoping yeah, and then, you know, you can start on the phone and then gravitate towards that digital. Uh, for people asking about um, how we configure our tablets, I'm going to send you a link in the chat from AbilityNet, who we work with. Um, and that helps you, gives you some a baseline to start with. So you can have a look there. I've just posted that NCM link in the chat. Um, the, uh, I think Sophie wanted to know if we could do, we could share the DCN, she could share it. Um, that You can share the, the knowledge, I would say that much. Um, but yeah, because it's a, it's licensed to one person, um, 
every every license. So yeah, the, the key thing about being a digital champion is that you take the learning on and you and you share it. So even if you've just got one license in your organization, you've got access to the information. So you can share the information rather than sharing them through the login. I've just shared in the chat our three four number as well that while you're in the midst of setting up your uh, champion projects, if you do have learners or people that need help digital uh, skills, we run a free phone number, which is 0808-196-5883. So you can signpost your learners to our free phone number in the meantime as well. We 